Let's do this. All right. Um, so my name is David Vossel. I work at Red Hat. And today I want to talk about Pacemaker, uh, and specifically uh, how we're using Pacemaker to power OpenStack high availability. So first off, my title, it might be a little bit vague. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit later on why I think Pacemaker is OpenStack's PID1, and what that even means. But I want to be clear about the purpose here. The purpose is I want to discuss OpenStack high availability and how I think Cornerstone, um, Pacemaker is the cornerstone that makes our uh, OpenStack high availability architecture possible. But before discussing the specifics on OpenStack high availability, I want to do something a little bit different. So it's easy for me to rattle off how we're doing uh, HA, and it's really not that complex. It's actually simple, um, which just makes it powerful. But uh, without some background, understanding why we made certain decisions, I don't think it's going to have the same impact. Um, so I'm finding a lot of times the questions we had to ask to arrive at a solution are oftentimes more important than the solution itself. So to illustrate where we've come from and where we're going, I want to start with a story. So the title of our story is The Future of HA and How Pacemaker Saved the Day. And it rhymes, so I guess that's cool. So the story goes like this. Once there was a database. It looked like this. But this was a special database. It wasn't like the other databases. This was a distributed self-replicating database. So everyone saw this and they said, distributed self-replicating database, this is exactly what we were looking for. The fault tolerance is built directly into the application itself. If one node goes down, the rest of the nodes can pick up the slack. So there's no expensive shared storage in use. Everything just kind of works. It's magic. And everyone was happy. But then they started to think, OK, this is really neat, but how do we load balance this thing? Uh, so they wondered, maybe HA proxy could help. I mean, HA proxy, it's a load balancer. That's kind of what it does, right? And sure enough, HA proxy said, uh, no problem. I got this. Load balancing, it's what I do. And everyone was happy. But then everyone started thinking again, OK. So what happens if, if a database node dies? Does that just mean some client requests aren't getting processed anymore? Or what's really going on here? And to this, HA proxy said, no problem. I got this. So if a database instance dies, HA proxy is actually able to monitor for unresponsive database instances and route the traffic to the remaining um, database instances. Um, so that works. But everyone wasn't quite convinced. Uh, thinking more about high availability, everyone asked HA proxy another question. So what happens if the load balancer dies? And to this, HA proxy said, nothing. And because HA proxy was unresponsive, everyone got to see exactly what happens when the load balancer dies. Client requests are no longer processed. Everything grinds to a halt. And it's not exactly what everyone had in mind for high availability. So the problem is obvious. How do we uh, have redundant load balancing? Uh, we need uh, to have resilience built into our load balancer. So the application or the database is fault tolerant in and of itself, but load balancing isn't. So to fix this, initially, we use KeepAliveD. So with KeepAliveD, we have the ability uh, to have a virtual IP address assigned to our HA proxy instances, which we have redundant HA proxy instances. So if a HA proxy instance dies, the virtual IP moves to another active HA proxy instance. So we can have HA proxy instances failing, database instances failing, and clients have no clues what's going on. Everything just keeps working. Um, so this is kind of awesome. This is what we were looking for, right? Kind of. There's a problem. So everyone asked one last very important question. What actually happened to the unresponsive nodes, the ones that are grayed out here, uh, the ones that KeepAliveD is telling us are dead and they're routing traffic uh, to the virtual IP address to the other instances? So, to the answer to this question, KeepAliveD says, what other nodes? Except the answer came in the form of an echo, because the reality is the other instances, they weren't unresponsive at all. There was a network split and two partitions had formed. So at this point, they're having data consistency issues, clients are writing things and able to retrieve them. 
and just other weird, undeterministic behaviors occurring. So everyone hung their head in shame. They said, we've made a huge mistake. But they couldn't figure out where they've gone wrong. I mean, they had a distributed self-replicating database that had the fault tolerant built directly into it. They had redundant load balancing. But they're still having data consistency issues. So, so how do we fix this? For us, the solution was Pacemaker. So Pacemaker handles the prevention of split partitions very well. It's native into how Pacemaker works. We have some very sophisticated mechanisms to handle this uh, that I'll touch on in a little bit. Uh, besides just being able to handle this very well, um, there's quite a bit more that Pacemaker has to offer here. So Pacemaker gives us this concept of system level high availability. Um, this is a holistic approach. It completely eradicates the need for Keep Alive D. Um, with Pacemaker, Pacemaker is managing the virtual IP address, the HA proxy instances, and the database instances. And so if an HA proxy instance goes down, Pacemaker is able to relocate the virtual IP address for us. It's also able to not just monitor the HA proxy instance and say, oh, it failed. That's too bad. It's actually able to invoke action. It's able to say, the instance failed. Let's recover it. Same thing with the database instances. It's able to invoke action. So it doesn't just sit back and watch. Okay, so Pacemaker lets um, users define a policy to define uh, what services to run, where to run those services, uh, those relationships between services, and uh, potentially the locations that they run. And Pacemaker is able to enforce that policy to produce system-wide deterministic behavior. So there's no unknown states here with Pacemaker. Pacemaker has a complete view of the entire system. If, um, we want to simulate what happens if a resource fails. Uh, we don't actually have to fail that resource and just watch what happens. We actually know. It's determined. It's predetermined. Uh, we can actually feed in that failure to our simulation program and actually produce a graph that shows like, how everything's going to be reallocated throughout the cluster. So everything is predetermined. Um, it's a finite state machine, and there's no uh, unknown states. So going back to our story. With Pacemaker, we don't question this scenario for two reasons. One, we trust our quorum provider. It's, uh, it's very good at handling um, these tiebreaker type scenarios. And two, we don't question what happens because we have Stoneth. So uh, Stoneth is Pacemaker's fencing daemon. And fencing is a large part of why Pacemaker is able to produce deterministic behavior. So Stoneth is an acronym for shoot the other node in the head. Uh, if Pacemaker's ever in doubt about the state of a node, a node's fenced. So fencing, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's just a process of taking a node and separating it from an active cluster. So you're taking a misbehaving node and separating it from the healthy nodes. Typically, typically this is going to be like a, a power fencing, where Stoneth actually talks to a physical device at the power switch and, and flips it off. Um, but it's not just limited to that. There's lots of different types of fencing devices. You can have um, like virtual fencing, where um, Pacemaker or Stoneth is going to talk to a script at uh, the virtual machine host and kill the actual virtual machine PID. So Stoneth is really smart. And with Stoneth, um, we don't question the state of the misbehaving nodes because we know the state. They're dead. So a quick recap. Pacemaker, without Pacemaker and Stoneth, we potentially have split partition issues, and uh, we have no centralized way of recovering uh, resources. I should point this out, though. It's possible to handle these split partition issues with Keep Alive D. Um, it's not native necessarily to how Keep Alive D works, and it's very difficult to get this behavior. You have to work really hard to do what Pacemaker natively has very sophisticated and simple ways of doing. Um, so with Pacemaker and Stoneth, we don't have to worry about split partitions and um, we get this centralized management of all our resources. So the takeaway from this part is uh, Pacemaker and load balancing, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, Pacemaker handles actual resource management. It's actually handling the starting and stopping of the load balancer. Load balancer is just handling distribution of traffic. So in a lot of ways, they're meant for each other. It's kind of cute, right? Okay.
So that's my intro. <laughs> so now we're back to the title of my presentation. And I'm going to get to talk about some more interesting stuff. So before I talk about OpenStack specifics, I want to explain this part. Why do I think Pacemaker is uh, a distributed PID1? And what do I even mean by that? So to understand what I mean by that, let's take a look at what a PID1 or a NIT daemon does. In this case, we're going to look at System D. So System D, it launches services in parallel. This is why we get our super fast boot up times. You can boot your laptop in like two seconds rather than two minutes a few years ago. Um, yet it's able to observe strict ordering between services as they boot up. So if you're looking at this diagram here, um, RabbitMQ and Galera, they don't depend on each other. Nova depends on both of those things. So RabbitMQ and Galera, they can start at the same time in parallel. We want Nova to wait until those uh, services are up. The last thing a system D does with respect to resource management is able to monitor and recover failed resources. So that's all really cool, but there's a problem for us. OpenStack services, they're not centralized to one node. They're distributed. So in this case, Galera, it, Galera doesn't exist on one node. Galera exists on a distributed set of nodes. So we need to be able to say, start Galera cluster, form that cluster, gain quorum, make that Galera cluster available, then start everything that depends on that cluster, like Nova. So systemd is limited to uh, one node, so it can't coordinate this. The pacemaker can. This is what pacemaker was designed to do. So with pacemaker, we can actually say, start a layer cr cluster across three nodes, form that cluster, once it's available, then start Nova. In fact, if we go back and look at what a PID1 does, we see that pacemaker actually does all those things. Um, pacemaker can launch services in parallel, yet observe strict ordering between those services. And it can monitor and, uh, monitor and recover failed resources as well. But unlike system D, Pacemaker can do this across any number of nodes with any number of resources. So what allows us to do this? An important aspect of Pacemaker's configuration is resource constraints. So with resource constraints, um, well, first off, we define the resources the pacemaker is going to manage. And with resource constraints, we can draw relationships between those resources. So things like uh, ordering constraints, start X, resource X, then start resource Y. Um, this is what we're doing with Galera. We're saying start Galera, then start uh, Nova. Co-location um, constraints. We want to say put resource X with resource Y. This is what we do with HA proxy and a virtual IP address. We want the virtual IP address to be placed with an active HA proxy instance. So the big thing to get about this, though, is these two types of constraints, um, they work independently of each other. So start resource X and start resource Y, that doesn't mean they have to be on the same node, even. Um, but they could be. You could also combine them. You could say start resource X and start resource Y and make sure they're co-located together. So it's kind of an either or sort of thing. There's a lot of power in that. Um, the flexibility of being able to um, do, have those work independently of each other is uh, given Pacemaker a lot of flexibility and power um, for OpenStack high availability. So speaking of OpenStack high availability, let's dive in. So how does this work? Um, if I could break down our OpenStack high availability architecture into one sentence or statement or collection of words. I don't know. There's some characters in there that aren't really letters. Um, it's going to be pacemaker, managing virtual IPs, load balancers, controller services to maximize the availability of OpenStack APIs. Basically, it's this pattern over and over and over again. It's uh, probably understand why I told that story earlier. Um, so the pattern starts like this. We have a virtual IP address. Every virtual IP address is dis, um, assigned to a backend service. So um, there's a virtual IP address for every API. From there, we have an HA proxy instance, which takes this front end virtual IP address and distributes it to the back end uh, services. Wherever an active HA proxy instance is, a virtual IP address can run. And lastly, we have our services, which 
Um, most of them run active-active. Some of them are still an active-passive, but we're working with the community on that. Um, these are the services you're familiar with. This is Nova. This is Glance. This is Keystone. There's also things like um, Galera, Aretas. Um, it's, uh, it's the underlying infrastructure. So one thing I want to point out here, and it's important for scaling, is Pacemaker's use of the clone resource type. So all these services, um, they use clones. And what a clone is, with Pacemaker, we can define a resource once, just one time in the config, and we say how many replicas of that resource we want. So with HAProxy, we want redundant HAProxy instances. So we want to spread out um, all our HAProxy instances across all the nodes. So we declare it once and say replicate across all the nodes. Same with our services. So if we want more capacity, we just add more nodes, and Pacemaker can dynamically grow our configuration. And one thing to point out about this is when Pacemaker dynamically grows configuration, the ordering and co-location, all those constraints, they still apply. So it's really, it, it's growing it, but we're still having the same behavior. This is a more detailed look, I guess, at how, how this works. Again, we have a virtual IP address, uh, things that want to access uh, the backend services. They all talk to the virtual IP address. That's how we're providing high availability. So Glance and Nova need access to the backend database. They're always going to talk to the Glara virtual IP address, and uh, we're always going to make that available. So let's talk about um, some of our deployment strategies for this pattern. First one I want to talk about is the collapsed architecture. So with the collapsed architecture, all controller nodes are identical to one another. Um, this require, requires kind of more powerful hardware because every node uh, actually has to run every OpenStack service. Um, it's really easy to deploy. Um, it's really easy to deploy because everything's just a clone. Um, so if we look into this a little bit more detail, we can see our pattern all throughout um, the collapsed architecture. So there's Nova, Nova APIs. I'm trivializing some of this. I know there's a lot more to Nova than just a little box. Um, but virtual IP address assigned to Nova. We have the same thing with Glance, and it's uh, back-end Glance services there. And if we want to scale our collapsed architecture, these are all clones. Remember what I said about clones earlier? Scaling is just a matter of adding more nodes. Everything's dynamic. Well, as far as Pacemaker is concerned. So let's look at startup order in a little bit more detail. So remember what Pacemaker is giving us here. We're getting re reliable load balancing through managing the HA proxy instances and the virtual IP address. But we're also getting cluster-wide startup ordering. And some of the startup ordering, some of the things Pacemaker is doing here are really complex. Um, so trying to bootstrap a Galera cluster, that requires a lot of hand-holding. Um, they've improved things upstream, but it's still difficult. Um, so I'll tell you the process, and I think it's neat that Pacemaker is actually able to automate this. So to bootstrap a Galera cluster, you have to look at every one of these instances. You have to pick one of them out. And um, well, you have to look at every one of them and find which one has the highest right sequence number. Once you've done that, that's the one you want to use to bootstrap. So you start that one first, then you start all the other instances, and they have to connect to that and sync. So there's a lot of steps involved, and then the, these steps are distributed across lots of nodes. Pacemaker can actually automate that in a very deterministic and safe way, um, where previously it was pretty difficult. So we can say, bootstrap Galera, then start anything that depends on Galera, like Nova. Likewise, we can unwind the process. So if we want to stop Galera, say we want to do a, a package upgrade, um, we can say stop Galera, and it's going to do a graceful unwind of the shutdown order. So it's going to shut down anything that depends on Galera first, like Nova. Then it's going to shut down Galera, and you can do package upgrades or whatever you want to do. Another example of complex start ordering is Redis. Um, so we're using Redis for Solometer. 
and um, Redis is this master slave replication thing for us. Um, so we have to start every instance of Redis in slave mode. Pacemaker is able to pick out one of those instances, start and master. Only once the master instance is up will we start anything that depends on Redis. Okay. So that was our collapsed architecture. Second deployment method um, is our segregated architecture. And for this, um, every service has its own uh, dedicated hardware or virtual machine. So this is going to scale much further, potentially. Um, requires lots and lots of nodes. But uh, it's kind of flexible in that because you can, um, you can add capacity where it makes sense to add capacity. You don't have to just add capacity and get all your service replicated. You can add capacity in just certain areas. Um, so taking a closer look here, we can see like you breaking out the glare cluster. You could have your own dedicated hardware just for load balancing. And uh, it, the list just goes on. But I, I don't know how useful it is to have a pure segregated architecture. I think it's going to be a lot more common for us to see things like this mixed architecture where you have um, most of your architecture is in this collapsed view, where Pacemaker is managing everything in its clones on maybe a set of three nodes. But then you might break out certain parts of the cluster, like uh, maybe you have dedicated hardware just for load balancing, or just for the database, or, or whatever else you need to add capacity to in a separate way than the collapsed architecture. OK. So let's review some of the advantages of pacemaker managing controller services. So these are advantages that are on top of pacemaker's solid quorum and fencing, fencing features. These are things that we just get uh, in addition. So we have to have quorum. We have to have fencing. We have to trust those mechanisms. Uh, if you don't have that, it's not good. But we get more than that. Um, we get the ability to automate some really complex bootstrap processes like Lair and Redis. We get to have ordered stop and starts so we can gracefully shut down a service. And we know that everything that depended on that service is going to shut down as well in an ordered fashion. So you can do package updates or whatever. Same thing with a node. You can gracefully um, turn off a node and know that everything's going to gracefully migrate somewhere else. Um, so you can do upgrades on your node. We also dynamically grow capacity by adding more pacemaker nodes, because we're using the cloned resource type. And we have this centralized view of the distributed service state. And this isn't, isn't something I've talked about yet, but it's, it's really cool. So with Pacemaker, you can look on any node and look into the cluster, and you can see exactly where all the resources are running, where resources have failed, what nodes are online, what nodes are offline. And in a lot of ways, I mean, that's kind of like what something like Nagios does. So, I mean, you're getting a view into the cluster similar to something like Nagios provides, except Pacemaker is actually able to um, be a Nagios that actually does the recovery as well, which is, um, is really cool. OK. So switching gears a little bit. So far, I've been talking about the um, OpenStack control plane high availability. But now I want to talk about something different. So um, when I start talking about compute node high availability, I'm often encountered with um, some ideological differences that make uh, the conversation difficult. Uh, so I'll explain what I mean by that. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the pets versus cattle argument. Um, so you have your pets. They're unique. You name them. You might only have a couple of, instance of instances of them. Uh, you spend a lot of time and energy maintaining them. Uh, if you want to scale, you have to throw out your old hardware and get faster hardware. It scales only vertically, uh, as opposed to cattle, which um, cattle, you have lots and lots of them to make a herd. Uh, they don't have names. They have numbers. You kind of feed and water them, but you don't really give them individual attention. They scale horizontally, so you just throw more and more instances of cattle to gain more capacity. So here's the problem. I feel like sometimes we've told ourselves to HA, it's only for the pet scenario. And somehow the herd saves us from needing high availability. Um, and that's, that's not true. Certainly, 
we want um, to deploy different methods for cattle than we do pets. Uh, I don't think it may, pets have their own high availability techniques that don't apply to cattle. Um, but that doesn't mean we won't, don't want to detect that you know, there's dead cattle and automate the recovery of those instances. Uh, we want to maximize the availability of the cattle, just like we did the pets. It just looks a little bit different. We also want to be able to do things like isolate dead cattle instances or misbehaving instances from the rest of the herd. So I'm not necessarily talking about bringing kind of these old rigid high availability techniques of the past in. Um, I think uh, we need to bring something new in, something that's tailored to this use case. So I think Pacemaker, it bridges the gap between this old high availability world and the new. Uh, and we can see this in how we scale. So the core Pacemaker infrastructure is traditionally been limited to 16 nodes. And this is a limitation on the CoreSync membership layer. Um, CoreSync is this, it's got this mesh network that grows exponentially in, in complexity. So the more nodes you get, the more complex it gets. And once you get to around 16 nodes, um, sometimes people can push beyond that, but it starts getting a little bit crazy. So for pets, 16 nodes, that's fine. Maybe small herds. But 16 nodes for cattle, that's a joke. So we did something about it. We recognize the pacemaker's policy engine, the finite state machine that's making all the decisions about uh, resource state and how to react to failures and things like that. That's our most valuable asset. Uh, and it turns out it's not limited to any sort of 16 node limitation. Um, it can scale much further than that. So how do we break that piece out of the 16 node limitation? And um, our solution was pacemaker remote. So pacemaker remote, it's not bound by any sort of messaging limitations. And with pacemaker remote, we can scale pacemaker to hundreds, uh, potentially thousands of nodes. So what is pacemaker remote? It's pretty simple. It's just a daemon. Uh, this daemon, if we're going to get down to it, it's just a lightweight way of integrating a, a node into a pacemaker cluster that doesn't require core sync. Pacemaker remote cluster services, they can run on remote nodes in the exact same way they can run on normal pacemaker nodes. Um, to pacemaker, a remote node and a uh, pacemaker node ran core sync, they look the exact same. Pacemaker treats uh, it as if it's a single partition. So uh, services can be distributed across all the nodes, remote nodes, or pacemaker plus core sync nodes in the exact same way. So while it can uh, run, pacemaker remote can run the exact same nodes as pacemaker does or did, um, I see the use case that pacemaker remote is going to thrive in is when we start using cloned resources. Um, and this is for a few reasons. Um, the primary one is that once we start using clone resources and we have lots and lots of nodes, pacemaker's policy engine, that finite state machine, um, it's much more efficient at calculating transitions. Um, and we need that to be snappy. We don't want our transitions to take seconds to calculate. We want it to be you know, milliseconds. Uh, and clone resources help us with that. So the use case I'm envisioning here is, um, I'm not sure if I made this clear, pacemaker remote requires a small pacemaker cluster. I'm envisioning uh, three nodes for your pacemaker cluster. That cluster is going to be making all the decisions about everything else. So it's the one that's producing all the uh, transition graphs and things like that. Those three nodes are going to power a much larger set of pacemaker remote nodes. Pacemaker remote, it's monitoring services. It's doing whatever the pacemaker cluster tells it to do. Uh, and it's just reporting back. So if we look back at our, um, or if we look at our OpenStack compute node architecture, um, we can see this is going to make a lot of sense for us. So looking at our collapsed architecture for the controller nodes, we see we already have a small pacemaker cluster. It's already powering all of our OpenStack services. So we can utilize that pacemaker cluster to power a much larger set of compute instances. Um, so our pacemaker remote instances here are running our compute nodes. And you can see that we have four services in there. And this, is, this outlines another cool aspect um, feature that Pacemaker has. So we have clones where you define a resource once, 
and you can replicate over and over and over again. We also clone a group, so a set of resources. In this case, we've um, defined four resources that make up our compute node, do all our compute node stuff. And we've said, this is a group. Launch this group as a clone across every pacemaker remote instance. So what does this solution give us? We can maximize the availability of compute instances. So pacemakers not only, um, it, it can recover compute instances when, when they're having trouble or whatever, um, but there's a trick we have, uh, and this is where the value really is. Um, pacemaker is monitoring both compute nodes, so it's able to see when bad things are happening on compute nodes, and it's monitoring the controller nodes. Uh, so it's monitoring Nova and Keystone and Glance and it's able to co coordinate between the two. So we're actually able to do some kind of fun here. Um, if we detect something bad's going on a compute node, we can um, talk to Nova and say, this compute instance uh, is just bad. It's gone. Uh, don't even worry about it anymore. And we're able to trigger the evacuation of the compute instances who are on that compute node uh, much more efficiently and say, Nova, okay, this node's gone, start them somewhere else. So we're actually able to coordinate the evacuation of virtual machine instances or containers or whatever. So there's one last thing the pacemaker is able to do with compute instances. Sometimes compute instance, instances go uh, really bad. Uh, maybe um, something catastrophic has happened, they're unresponsive, uh, the node's failing in a way that can't be recovered. So for this, we need a way to isolate that compute instance from the rest of the herd. Uh, we don't want that compute node running uh, virtual machines anymore. We don't want it to be available to do that because there's something wrong with it. Uh, we don't know necessarily what's wrong with it, but we don't want it there anymore. And to do this, um, we have a secret weapon, Stoneth. So, Pacemaker and Pacemaker Remote can both do fencing. Uh, we can fence um, Pacemaker Remote nodes in the exact same way that we fence Pacemaker nodes. And there's no, nothing special about them. So, the, you know, a, pace, uh, a compute node is just going crazy. We can cut it off. And then we can trigger the evacuation of those VM instances to a healthy compute node. Okay. So I'm kind of winding down now. So I want to leave us with this. So what's the future for Pacemaker? The problems I'm most interested in uh, mostly involve scaling. So I want to know. I want to know how many services we can run. Um, I want to know how many nodes we can run. A few years ago, a few years ago Pacemaker, it was primarily used just in uh, two node clusters. Uh, we understood the power of Pacemaker. We understood the power of the finite state machine that exists in Pacemaker. We knew that could be expanded beyond that. Um, so it's been, it's been really rewarding to untap that power uh, and make it available to cloud infrastructure like OpenStack. So I think Pacemaker is a solid foundation for OpenStack high availability, and uh, I'm really excited to see where it goes from here. Questions? Uh, can you guys use the mic? Is Pacemaker Remote planned for uh, OSP7? Um, I don't know if I should talk about that. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> what if um, your process is no longer a process, but it's you know like a, something running in a thin container, like a Docker? Can Pace, does Pacemaker have the tools to monitor, restart processes in thin containers like that? Yeah, you can. Uh, so there's a Docker resource agent, actually. So we can, um, we can launch services in a Docker container and monitor them across the distributed set of nodes. Uh, that's actually something I'm really interested in lately. And we have um, some new features that are coming out with this that are going to make it a lot more transparent for people. Um, but they haven't really been announced yet, uh, even upstream. I mean, the work's there. I just haven't documented it, so 
I can't really point you guys to anything, but the Docker resource agent absolutely exists, so you can do a lot of that today. I have a kind of a specific question about RabbitMQ. Uh, oh. <laughs> does it? Uh, I know uh, traditionally they had talked about using PaceMaker, but nowadays, you know, has its own t internal mirrored queues. Does it make sense to use PaceMaker with RabbitMQ these days, or just or just stick with the mirrored the mirrored uh, queues that they provide? I'm not sure that's mutually exclusive. Um, so PaceMaker is managing starting RabbitMQ, and it's actually coordinating um, how it works right now. Is PaceMaker um, is actually making sure that uh, RabbitMQ successfully um, forms a cluster. So we uh, we start RabbitMQ maybe across three nodes or whatever, and we're actually PaceMaker is coordinating to make sure that that RabbitMQ cluster forms quorum and everything is available. So yes. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Oh, hey. You were, uh, you were earlier on in the talk talking about the similarities between SystemD and Pacemaker. And uh, one, one of the neat things about SystemD is the ability to declaratively describe a service and its um, dependencies and how it starts, how it stops, and all those things like that. Yep. With Pacemaker, what I've seen in the past, at least, is giant shell scripts with large collections of PCS commands that um, you run, you end up with some dependencies and things in Pacemaker. And if you decide you don't like what you've installed, you have to kind of reverse that. Is there any way to provide Pacemaker with a declarative, um, basically, map of here's a bunch of services, here are the constraints for these services, I want to give them to you so you can install them, and I want you to be able to take them out of your Pacemaker configuration very easily? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand how we don't do that already. So uh, PCS is our configuration mechanism, and I mean, you were talking about that earlier. Um, how can you not take the I can write a shell out. script that will do some of that, and then I can write another shell script that will undo that, but that's a different thing. That those two things aren't magically synchronized, and if I make a change in one, I have to make a change in the other, and it's not a declarative syntax either. Um, it is it is a step-by-step -step execution of shell script commands. So I am asking, I guess, if there's something like a unit file for Pacemaker. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. No, we don't have unit files for that. So what you're doing when you're using, I mean, I understand what's going on in that shell script. Um, you're invoking PCS commands, which actually write to the Pacemaker configuration. There's a distributed database within Pacemaker itself that holds this configuration. So you're committing changes to that database, and you want to be able to reverse them. Yes. Um, PCS helps with that quite a bit. It abstracts a lot of that away. If you're doing something like you create a resource and you build all these dependencies between it, and then you want to take that resource out of the configuration, if you do something like a PCS delete, it's going to take out that resource and all the constraints associated with it. Um, but yeah, you do have to go in and you, you are okay. manually uh, drawing a lot of these relationships yourself. Okay. Um, so there's not a way, there's no such thing as a unit file for okay. Pacemaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first question is related to the pacemaker versus pacemaker remote. Just to make sure that I got it right. Uh, the non-pacemaker remote machines, they're actually, uh, the nodes, they're actually responsible for like forming the quorum, the quorum and... Nope. No? Uh, wait, wait. Say that one more time. Uh, to form the cor the, the quorum. The, the yeah, non-pacemaker remote nodes? Yeah. Or, okay. So I'll explain how that works. Um, the one thing the pacemaker remote nodes don't do is take place in quorum. That's why you need the small pacemaker cluster. So your three uh, pacemaker nodes, mm -hmm. they form quorum. Mm -hmm. uh, pacemaker remote has nothing to do with the quorum of the pacemaker partition. OK, that, that, that's, that's actually what I was uh, saying. Uh, the, the second question is actually, uh, I'm not suggesting the architecture, but uh, is pacemaker able to like go and look into two different levels, suppose like your uh, deploying Keystone with the MySQL database, and you want to have HA on the MySQL database, and on top of that, to have like HA on the OpenStack level, you actually depend on that service. Can you manage like uh, across the two levels, or would I ha would I need like two different pacemaker clusters there? It's you. You only have one pacemaker cluster. Okay. Um, if you. You, it wouldn't make sense to have two pacemaker clusters on the same sets of nodes. You have one pacemaker cluster that coordinates all the services, just like you have one system D. Okay. Does that all right. sense? We can talk more later then. Right. Okay, cool. So, uh, how do you stop Stoneth from dueling in a bifurcation? Uh, say that one more time. How do you stop Stoneth from shooting each other? <laughs> 
Uh, so we don't. It's actually CoreSync that does that. Um, so CoreSync has uh, very so sophisticated tie-breaking mechanisms um, where if there's split partition, um, it's very good at telling one side that it won and the other side that it didn't. Um, so that's how it's prevented. The one that won shoots the other one. Got it. So my question was specifically uh, for pacemaker monitoring services. Okay. So, uh, is, uh, so is there any uh, feature where pacemaker has some advanced way of monitoring services as opposed to just doing service status? Like uh, if, let's say for instance, my service is, uh, has, some end, has some endpoint applications which I can do monitoring, monitoring or health checks to make sure that the service is up and running. Because we run into issues where the service is up but it's not doing anything, it's throwing errors. So we want some more advanced monitoring for pacemaker to do on the service. So is there a way for pacemaker to do that? I'm not sure I completely follow that question. Um, Custom resource agent. Okay, all right, that's what, that's what I was good at, yeah. So um, pacemaker has the ability to um, use a lot of different resource types. So you have, we can control system D. We control like LSB, like mm -hmm. the old init style scripts. Oh, but great. we also have these OCF scripts, uh -huh. which we write that allows us to do some really detailed monitoring, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I have a question. You have talked about uh, compute nodes being, you know, sort of having the infrastructure there being managed by Pacemaker, but Pacemaker's policy engine can scale really well and has all these advanced features like utilization-based resource placement and so on. Are you actually, have you ever looked at using the Pacemaker policy engine also for placing the VMs or containers themselves? So like getting a little bit into the Nova territory? We haven't looked at that, no. Okay. Why not? Um, uh, maybe that's a good idea. I'm not a part of the Nova project. That could be that could be an interesting use case. So uh, as as we relate to containers, um, is there any advantage to running Pacemaker instead of uh, Fleet or Kubernetes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, you get really deterministic and proven behavior. With pacemaker, I mean Kubernetes and all these new like Fleet and Kubernetes, they're neat and everything, but you're not getting um, the same deterministic behavior. So it's difficult to use Kubernetes to define. You can define ordering and things like that, but um, pacemaker is a finite state machine and it's locked. Uh, all these things are locked, and we have really fine control over the exact state of the cluster. <laughs> I think they're recreating pacemaker, if I'm being honest. I had a question about like fencing and Stoneth. If you've got your three node uh, deployment you're talking about, right, and you lose, say, glance on one of the nodes dies, is it granular enough to just shoot that glance note, glance process, or is it going to shoot the whole node just because glance died? And then are you like propagating failure to places that shouldn't be? Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, deterministic behavior. We do what you tell us to do. Uh, in the case of Glance, um, we're going to try to restart that node. I mean, that instance, uh, excuse me. Um, so it's not necessarily that we're going, I mean, what, is it, what happens if Glance fails? Do you want to stone us? Do you want to fence that node? I mean, you probably don't want to. What you want to happen is just have requests no longer um, routed to that Glance instance. So HAProxy is going to detect that it's unresponsive. Uh, and it's no longer going to get requests to it, Pacemaker is just going to try to restart that instance of Glance. If it can't restart it, then it's just going to mark it failed, and you're not going to get, it's not going to get fenced just for Glance failing. I mean, if you wanted to, you can go in and say, if Glance fails, then fence this no. But by default, no, we don't do that. Hello. Can Pacemaker make use of multiple heartbeat network? For example, I think there can be multiple rings in the crossing. Uh, configuration. Can, can Pacemaker make use of that? Or how can it deal with that? Um, that's the layer below Pacemaker. Uh, you'd want to talk to CoreSync about that. So Pacemaker is going to utilize whatever CoreSync gives it. Um, okay. So you're talking about redundant rings, and uh, I'm not the person to talk to about that. Okay, Sorry. this is actually because, uh, for example, you have a compute node, and 
you have storage network and you have management network. If your management network is down, but your storage and tenant network is okay, you won't have to restart or, or shoot the compute node because uh, this will trigger uh, unnecessary service interruption for the, for the application and the workloads. Yes, so, that's a good so, use case for it. Yes, so if pacemaker can use multiple heartbeat rings, and if we can deal with that in the resource agent, it, it will be very nice. And this is an uh, uh, actual problem for, for us. We are using pacemaker a lot. Hmm. Uh, it's core sync. Oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think, uh, how much, are we done? Yeah, or? we're over. I'm sorry, uh, we're done. Uh,